Hi, this is International Master David Proust uh, with the third video in a row about uh, applying principles in the King's Gambit. I hope you saw the first two videos, but if you didn't, you can still understand this video. You don't need them. Uh, so just go ahead and, and enjoy this if you can. Um, so here we are in the King's Gambit. Black takes. White plays knight f3, and black plays bishop to e7. Now, you have to understand the point of this move. The point of this move is to play bishop h4 check before white's able to castle and prevent him from castling. Now, how should white respond to this? Well, usually white plays the move bishop to c4, so that after white gets checked, their king doesn't block that bishop in. Okay? A very, very understandable desire. But, um... If you're looking for a less common idea, then here's another move that you can try. You could try the move d4, allowing your king to be pushed into the center. So what we're going to talk about today is what we think of positions with the white king strangely placed in the center. How to kind of think about those positions and what kind of principles you can apply as you play them, right? So here's an intro for where that idea comes from. Here is a, a gambit of Steinitzes, right, which was to just emphasize the central point of the king's gambit, right? He's not trying to emphasize development and the F file, right, with quick castling. Instead, he's trying to point out that the point of the king's gambit is to get the center, even at the cost of a horrendous placement for his own king. And that's where this idea sort of comes from. Now, that's not a very great line for white, um, but uh, in this position here, white has a reason to think that it might be more profitable now to play d4 than in the other version. And the reason is that the bishop on h4 is going to be awkward, and we know that as white. So let's say I play d4, you check, I play here. Um, let's look at the position of this bishop on h4. It's in the way of black's development, because black would love to develop the knight to f6 and castle, but if they do, they hang the bishop. So by going into this position with the king on e2, white is creating a mutually awkward situation, right? Their king is bad and blocking in their bishop too, but black's bishop is also bad, right? And limiting their own development possibilities. And white's hoping to sort of recoup and cover up their center with bishop f4 and knight c3 quickly. And then, actually, the, the principle, I would say, is that white's actually fine if they have time to do all that. So let's say black just had to bring the bishop back, and you took on f4, and they played knight f6, and we had the time to defend the pawn on e4. Black castles, white defends the center more, right? Black will probably, black could consider striking back in the center. But um, let me just, for the sake of argument, do it a little bit differently for a move. And, you know, maybe like white does something like this. So in this case, white has probably successfully defended their center by completing their development. And soon the king will start running out of the way. And white will have a fine game. Okay? So that's um, just as like... Uh, just as a, a reference point, right? You have to have reference points. As a reference point, if white's able to cover everything in the center before black generates any threats against white's king, then king e2 is not really considered to be such um, such a horrible move. I mean, well, obviously it's a horrible move, but it's not considered to, like, you know, destroy all of white's game, right? So you can compensate for it by taking over the center. So what should black do in this position after king to e2? They could play d5, um, countering in the center. Um, they could play, uh, well, we've already ruled out knight to f6, hanging the bishop, right? Or they could um, they could try and play some move like g5, going for g4, and more annoyance against white's king. So uh, what do you think black should do? Or as I suggested earlier, they could you know retreat the bishop and then keep developing. I played some limp moves for black in that in that variation, so that wasn't necessarily something that should give you a sense of how good or bad bishop e7 is. So what do you think black should do here? 
Black did something entirely off of the list of things I gave you. So so don't get mad at me. Like I promised that my list was was complete or conclusive. You're definitely encouraged to think creatively here for Black and to you know consider any move that you think is interesting. Okay. So here's the move which is not any good, g5. That's no good because white will just trade that bishop, right? Forcing black to shatter their own pawn structure. And then before black can do anything useful, white takes back their pawn, developing their bishop. And you see white will be able to play knight c3 and queen d3, right? Probably very like easily and safely and, um, and get a game here, right? The, I guess the one variation that you would want to calculate is d5 with the idea that if that your pawn in e4 is hanging and if you take or if you push, black has bishop g4 with some degree of pain for white. But the answer to that, I think, is queen to d3 and then white would be okay. Right, they get out of the way of bishop g4 check and they defend the pawn on e4. And now if black tries any tactics, white will just keep that file closed. I mean, the position should be perfectly good for white. Um, so then there's the move d5, which is definitely of some interest to try and put the bishop on g4 is really the idea. So for example, takes, uh, I, I would say bishop g4. I would not say queen takes d5 because of knight takes h4, right? So let's say bishop to g4 and uh, bishop takes f4, black can now play, queen takes d5, for example. I mean, there's a variety of things black can do at this point. They could also play just knight f6, developing. And um, this looks like a very, uh, a very good option for black because they've got lots of uh, pretty quick development and the center's a little bit open, right? So even though what's gonna happen is white's gaining material, right? Like they already, recaptured the pawn that they hung on f4, they took the, or that they sacked on f4, they took the pawn on d5 from black, right? They could get greedy and start going ahead material, or they could just play simpler moves and black will probably be sacrificing material at some point here. Um, but black's going to get really good attacking chances. So this is like interesting, and this is probably a good example of the way to play for black. Um, so your instincts and principles should also be telling you that a move like d5 is the right style of move, right? Because what's the answer to white's strategy of putting their king in the center? The answer is not simply to try and develop quickly. The answer is also that you need to strike back in the center and not let white consolidate the center. And you do have this awkward bishop, so you don't even have such a smooth way to just develop easily. So what you have to do is kind of throw a little bit of caution to the wind and play more aggressively, try and, try and open some lines and create some good counter chances against white's king. Don't let things become calm. Now, that would be a good move for black, but in the game, black plays b6. Now, this might be a bit of a surprise to you, a sort of strange possible development of the bishop opens up, of bishop a6, but this move is not entirely without basis. Here's the opening that it actually comes from. It comes from a Vienna, knight c3, knight c6, f4, ef4, d4, this is a version of a Steinitz gambit, right? And now here, black could play d5, sacking a pawn and trying to develop the bishop, okay? That's very good play. And you know, you should have the instinct to always be looking at that d5 move, just as it was the best move in the game we, we are looking at. But another possible variation is b6. And in that case, the way white plays is knight to b5, threatening knight c7, he manually blocks this bishop, and then he plays a4, to support the knight and keep the bishop blocked. Because that bishop check would be so um, disruptive to his king position, right? So that's what white has to go through to block it. And in that variation, that's a perfectly acceptable line for black to play. But in our game, it's less good. So here, b6 is not as good as in that Vienna. And white, if they think about this carefully and adapt correctly, they can immediately seize by a large advantage right here in one move. Just by finding an idea, you come up with one idea, and um, you know, right then and there, you can win or lose the game off of one move. That's quite common. So what do you hear? You should pause your videos, probably think about it, because I'm going to tell you 
The answer is, in some sense, maybe like straightforward or something. White just takes that pawn and creates a square on e3 for his king. And taking that pawn develops his bishop, gives his king a square. This is very, very important stuff, right? Because, let me go back a move. What you don't want is white is you don't really want like your king coming to d2 and blocking this bishop in, sorry, and blocking in this bishop, right? That's what you hate, right? Is when your king gets in the way of your pieces and it's just awkward and you can't get them out anymore, right? Black's just going to play knight f6 and let you bring out his knight for him. Actually, maybe he's hanging this piece again. <laughs> But anyway, you don't want that. You need a space for your king. And so what white does is they just take this pawn and they get a space for their king. And the difference between that and the Steinitz gambit variation from the Vienna that I showed you a moment ago. Hang on, I know black should play queen h4 check here. I'm just trying to transpose faster. In this position, white didn't have the move bishop takes f4. So bishop a6 was a much bigger threat. They had no convenient extra square for the king available, and they couldn't take the pawn on f4, right? So like knight f3, there's bishop a6 check, king f2, queen check. And this is not good for white. Back to our game. Bishop f4 pretty much refutes black's game and the point is that white's going to play king e3 and if you're shaking your head and laughing like what white's got the e3 square for his king what is david talking about i'm perfectly serious i'm often joking right i often tell you like someone's going to play some move and i'm like just kidding but in this case i'm serious or at least you'll find out by the end of the video whether or not i was serious about bringing the king up so black pursues their plan and white pursues what i said they were going to do and they defend these two center pawns solidly with the king. And if you look at it, it seems hard to imagine how black's going to get a foothold in the center, right? They still have the problem that they can't yet bring out the knight because of the bishop sacrifice. And, um, you know, by now, if they play d5, white can just avoid opening the game and gain more space and take away f6 from their knight. White could also perhaps get so bold as to just develop the knight and bring the knight into the center. Um, though it might be more advisable to play e5 and keep the game closed. Um, but d5 is probably still the mo most interesting move black can play, and I would guess completely insufficient. In the game, black traded, and you can see that just brought out white's rook, which is really good for white. If black retreats the bishop in order to play knight f6, by the way, white could you know, see reason and just start running away with the king at this point, right? Because the bishop on h4 is the piece that was cutting our king off before. I now castles king g1. I'm sure you can see that this is a simple advantage for white, right? With the central position of his pawns and more space. Better squares for his pieces. So black played knight to c6, right? So he's getting a tempo of development right? Maybe preparing for d5 on the next move. Um, there are a number of things you could do for white at this point. I mean, just the very simplest move, knight c3, is very safe. But I like the move that white actually played here, trying to just crush black and really like demonstrating that white thinks they have a big advantage at this point. In general, when someone plays like their knights to c6 or f6 and you can chase it and it doesn't have a great square to go, I like to see that. I like to chase it. Um, so white plays d5, kicking that knight because it can't go to either of the two central squares. And it can't go to e7 either because knight takes bishop. So the knight really has to go to a wretched square, and that's why I think d5 is the strongest move for white. So the black knight went over to a5. So now this is its only... Well, I guess it could come back to b7, right? But this is... c4 is his best square. And what does white do? He uses that space, right? Use your space, otherwise why do you have it? So the pawn on d5 gives white the space for queen to d4. The queen shuts off the knight and attacks g7. And this is really, really critical for black. I mean, basically, they need to block the queen's attack on g7, and then white's probably, I mean, I'm sure planning to just play e5, kicking that bishop as well. Bishop comes back. Um, b4 to stop bishop c5. Right, knight b7. Actually, 
might, might even play this move d6. I'm not sure. I hadn't thought of that before. I just thought they were going to play b4 and develop. Sorry. I thought white would just kick the knight and then develop, right? And black's kind of squished behind these pawns. But actually, it's often great to put the pawn on d6. Um, so white could also consider something like this. I don't know, something like this is plausible too, but the black rook's going to have a hard time coming out, but it did free up these pieces here by um, by resolving the situation in the center. So I guess my taste would still be for my original, what I'd originally seen here of um, just developing and leaving these two pawns like this, just sort of taking every square away from the black pieces. Right, and this is just a crushing advantage white has here in the game black was so um disoriented by how badly things were going with white's crazy king march that they brought their queen out trying to get a queen trade right which is obviously not the way to prove the advantage of having your opponent's king in the center but this move was also bad tactically because white can just win material what does white play here guys got to always stay sharp, right? That's one of the principles of the King's Gambit, too. It's not positional, but it is a principle to always stay sharp. White takes here, right? The Black Queen was defending the bishop on h4 and the pawn on g7. And so white's winning. Black took back, white takes on g7. Black can basically resign because if queen to f6, Um, just a moment. It should be e5. There's knight c4. Yeah, it's this move. b4 attacking the knight in order to play bishop to e5. And that's winning for white, right? Because if the knight checks, you can attack it with your king. And they have to save it. And just a completely winning position for white. They're just going to take on b5 in a moment, right? And this knight on c4 can't retreat because of bishop e5, right? Knight b6 ever, bishop e5 is the whole point of this. Um, and same with knight back to b7, right? This move. So, yeah, so black checked, a desperation check. The white king comes all the way up to d4, and black resigns. Right? Hilarious. There's only 13 moves, and white's managed to bring their king up to d4 and also win the game already. So, uh, hopefully... Uh, you learned something there about how to apply some principles, right? Notice that we need to have some kind of comparison positions, right? In order to play this move king e2, we have to know of some idea. And in order to find the right solution after b6, you have to understand what the point of these like king e2 type positions is, right? Um, and I think this is definitely a line that you could, you know, investigate or have fun trying out and playing. All right, so keep in mind the awkwardness of the bishop, the importance for black to strike back at the center and not to leave it, you know, pawn side by side for too long, right? So always, whether you're white or black, always look at the move d5 on every move, basically, right? Um, that's largely what I mean by, by using principle, right? Like, you know which moves are almost always the right kind of moves, so look at them. Um, and the principle here is that black wants to disrupt the center. And if you as white can get these squares well defended, and I mean not just defended once, but overprotect them, right? Like if black plays d6, defend e4 some more. Why not, right? He brings back his bishop, defend e4 some more. And now all these pawns, well, all these pawns, there's only two of them, sorry, but the, the center is so well defended by the white pieces that it's, a really powerful positional advantage for them. All right, that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. 
Hope you guys play the King's Gambit every now and then. And I'll see you around. Bye.